Well, good morning, friends. Good morning. Way to rise and shine this morning since we sprung forward an hour. And welcome to First Presbyterian Church. In this second Sunday of Lent, we do well to uh, be reminded of our recently defined why statement here at First Presbyterian Church. We've said that the reason we exist is to love the Lord our God with all our heart and all our soul, our mind and all our strength, and to love our neighbor as ourself. Jesus said that this is the first and most important commandment, and so that is why we are here this morning, and we are so glad you all are here, so we can worship God and learn how to love deeper and more authentically in Christ. So please, I'd ask you to just take a moment, pick up that pew pad to register your attendance, and if you're a guest or a visitor, we welcome you, and seriously, way to rise and shine this morning. I know it's not always easy adjusting to that time difference. So just want to uh, send a little message from the pulpit with growing concerns about the coronavirus. We simply want to be careful and proactive, not fearful. And so as you've heard from so many different uh, sources, I'm sure, we just encourage you to carefully wash your hands after contact with others. And for now, as we conclude worship, um, we just want to let you know that you're welcome. You don't need to join hands as we usually do. If you want to just touch elbows instead or just give a nice friendly nod to your neighbors and your left and your right, you're welcome to do that because we do want to just be preventative and wise at this time. So please also just continue to pray for our nation and the world as we navigate what this looks like for us. So we have some great news. We are in the middle of a food drive held by the deacons, and it goes for one more week. So if you picked up a bag, please return those with all that suggested food item list. Um, after You can do that after both services this Sunday morning, or the, it will officially end next Sunday in one week. So make sure to return your bags by next Sunday, March 15th. It's going to help support all the local food cupboards. All ages are invited to reach into the soulful and contemplative sound of gospel-inspired music and praise for unique worship experience. I've been here for a year and a half, and this is one of the most, I'm very excited, this is one of the most anticipated worship services for me, because we're doing a jazz Vesper service. I love music. I love jazz. It will be this Saturday, March 14th at 5 p.m. in Miller Commons. And one of the highlights of the church's Lenten programming, it's the band D4, F-O-R. They're an incredible jazz ensemble, and so we invite you to come and worship God in this way. And afterwards, we'll be sharing in a great meal together, a potluck meal. So if you're able, please bring a covered dish for the reception after the service. And if you can, please let us know what you will be bringing by clicking the register button and completing a short just a form on the events page. You can just go to our homepage, go to events, and you can click on the register button. There's no charge, but a free will offering will be taken. Also, a couples retreat is scheduled for April 17th through 19th in beautiful Cape May. Our guest presenters this year are dear friends of First Presbyterian Church, Tony and Katie Sendermeyer. They are both pastors and are such gifted and insightful teachers. So brochures can be found in the lobby, and you can also contact our office or go online on our events page to register there. Scholarships are available if you'd like to invite a friend or you yourself may be on a budget. We don't want anything to take away from you participating in this. The deadline is March 12th, so the end of this week, so please make sure to sign up. So friends, as we continue to prepare for worship on the second Sunday of Lent, listen to the law of God, the Ten Commandments. Then God spoke all these words. I am the Lord your God who brought you out of the land of Egypt, out of the house of slavery. You shall have no other gods before me. You shall not make for yourself an idol. You shall not make wrongful use of the name of the Lord your God. Remember the Sabbath day and keep it holy. Honor your mother and your father. You shall not murder. You shall not commit adultery. You shall not steal. You shall not bear false witness against your neighbor. You shall not covet what is your neighbor's. 
Having heard God's law, let us now seek the Lord with humility and hope. Let us worship God.
Good morning. Welcome to worship as we gather to celebrate our Lord Jesus Christ this morning. As you are able, I'd ask you to please stand and join me in the responsive call to worship found from Psalm 30. Sing praises to the Lord. And give thanks to his holy name. For the Lord, our God, healed us and restored us. When we cried for help in the times of deepest despair. The Lord has turned our sorrow into dancing. Take in our sackcloth from us and clothe us with joy. Sing to the Lord without end. And give thanks to the Lord forever. Come. Let us worship the Lord. Please remain standing for the prayer of adoration. Let's pray together. Our Heavenly Father, we come before you on this beautiful morning. We are here to worship, praise, and adore you. We thank you for all the wonderful things you have blessed us with, both individually and as a congregation. We pray that as we go throughout this day, throughout this week, and throughout this year, that you would help us to take all that you have given to us and to use it to further your kingdom. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Friends, please join me now in the Apostles with our affirmation of faith as the Apostles' Creed, which is in the front page of your hymnal. Friends, what is it that we believe? I believe in God the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Ghost, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, dead, and buried. He descended into hell. The third day he rose again from the dead. He ascended into heaven and sitteth on the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From thence he shall come to judge the quick and the dead. I believe in the Holy Ghost, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, 
the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. You may be seated. Lent is a season for getting honest before the Lord. Of course, God doesn't need any help in understanding us. Instead, we need a lot of help to be open before God and honest about our great need because, friends, we are frequently, even daily, self-fooled self, uh, and deceived. We are, as a rule, blind to our own needs and our wrongs. But with the Holy Spirit's aid, we can face the worst of our lives. The good news in Lent is that as we die to ourselves, we discover real, everlasting life from the Lord Jesus Christ. So let us then, with honesty and humility and the help of God's Holy Spirit, admit our sins to Almighty God. Would you join me as we offer the printed prayer of confession as it's found in your bulletins? My brothers and sisters in Christ, let us pray together. Most merciful Father, we confess that we have sinned against you in thought, word, and deed by what we have done and by what we have not done. We have not loved you with our whole heart. We have not loved our neighbors as ourselves. We are truly sorry and we humbly repent. For the sake of your Son, Jesus Christ, have mercy upon us and forgive us that we may delight in your will and walk in your ways to the glory of your name. Amen. Let's continue to speak to the Lord, to admit our wrong, to cry out for mercy. Will you join me in a time of silent prayer? Amen. You are forgiven this morning, and so am I. When we were dead in our sin and lost in darkness, God sought us, God loved us, and God brought us home. So hear and believe the good news of our faith in Christ. The mercy of the Lord is from everlasting to everlasting. May the God of mercy who forgives us all our sins strengthen us in all goodness and by the power of the Holy Spirit, keep us in eternal life. Amen. Please be seated. Friends, we have great joy this morning as we welcome new members who have been recently received by session into membership. I'd like to invite you to take out the insert and to keep it in front of you for in a moment as you see these friends come forward, your job as members of our church is to put names and faces together and to go out of your way today to welcome these new friends and in the coming weeks and months to make them feel completely at home here. We have received recently 10 new members. We have the joy of welcoming eight friends into our church family today. I'm joined by Elder Joyce Wensky. I'm going to ask her to introduce our friends to you. New members, as your name is called, please come forward and stand facing the congregation. Mark Christopher has joined by reaffirmation of faith. He lives in Cinnaminson and is a very good friend of many people in the Evergreens. James McIntyre has joined by reaffirmation of faith. 
He, is, he lives in Lumberton. Jennifer Moffa has joined by letter of transfer from the Berwyn Presbyterian Church. Jennifer, with her husband and children, live here in Morristown. Joe and Karen Malloy have joined by letter of transfer from the Covenant Presbyterian Church in Cinnamon, <clears throat> where they also live. Norman and Janice Olson have joined us by letter of transfer from the Presbyterian Church at Toms River, New Jersey. The Olsons live in Jobstown, New Jersey. Jonathan Schramm has joined by letter of transfer from the Hillsboro Presbyterian Church, and now he lives in Delran. Hey, Jonathan, good to see you. Well, friends, uh, good morning and welcome. Uh, boy, it's tough to, to be welcomed into church on the Time Change Sunday. So you guys, we give thanks for you. I'd like you now to give answer to the three questions of membership. Do you trust in Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior? If so, say, I do. Do you intend to be his disciple, to obey his word and to show his love? If so, say, I do. Will you be a faithful member of this congregation, giving of yourself in every way? And will you seek the fellowship of the church wherever you may be? If this is your promise, please say, I will. As I've come to know you, I see great gifts that God has given you that will enhance our congregation. And so I ask you to continue to seek God and to share what God has given you because we cannot be the church God wants us to be without your help. But the flip side of that coin is you cannot be the disciples that Jesus is calling you to be without us. And so we're delighted that God has brought you to us. So I want to acknowledge just briefly some of what I've come to see and I'm so grateful for today. So Jim McIntyre, would you take a step forward? Jim, in the deep sadness of losing Nancy last year, you found us. Standing on the deck of the ship years ago during your Merchant Marine years, you looked up into the night sky often and you, made that, you, you wondered then how big is this universe of ours and who is behind it? And you've come to know that presence, the Lord God, as your Savior and as your Lord. And so, Jim, we are so grateful that you are here with us. Welcome. Jennifer Moffa. Jenny, you went through a particularly tough period in your life a few years ago that really had the effect of just turning you back to God and you found the arms of the Lord open to you. You've been blessed by a beautiful family and I know how thankful you are for your husband and for your children. And so, Jenny, we welcome you and your family. We are so glad that you are here. Welcome. Joe. Joe, when you were with us a couple weeks ago, you shared your drug problem with us. You said, ever since you've known Karen, she's drug you to church, she's drug you to Bible studies, <laughs> and she's even drug you here. Thank God. And Joe, uh, it's more than being drug. I think it's probably more accurate to say you have a willingness to follow, and that will serve you well as you follow the call of the Lord Jesus Christ. Joe, you're a great gift to us, and we welcome you and Karen. Karen, stand next to your husband, the one you've been dragging around forever. <laughs> You told us how your parents instilled your faith in Christ from your earliest years. And God's given you gifts to praise him through singing and playing. In fact, you're playing at the end of the service today, aren't you? Thank you for just sharing your gifts so quickly and so fast. We welcome both of you in the name of Christ. Norman and Janice Olson, church matters a great deal to you both you have been a part of and have served faithfully the Presbyterian Church in Tom's River, and now here you are a part of this congregation. For that, we are grateful, and we welcome you now. And Jonathan, you grew up in the Presbyterian Church, but it was really when you were a student at TCNJ that you really committed your life to Christ. How thankful we are that you have found us, and how grateful we are for your faith, for your gift, for your willingness, my sense, is to simply say, Lord, here I am. Send me, use me. Jonathan, we welcome you today. And I have a charge. 
Friends, we welcome you to this church, our church, your church. We are so excited to have you, and I hope that you will discover the joy of sharing your gifts God has given you with this church family. Amen. <laughs> Greet them often, especially during today's coffee hour. I pray that we will all grow to, uh, to grow to full maturity in Christ by God's grace. Thank you, Joyce. Let's pray together for our new members. Almighty God, by the love of Jesus Christ, you draw people to faith and welcome them into the family of God. How grateful we are, Lord, for all of these friends that you've brought to us. May we show by your love, by embracing these new brothers and sisters who with us believe and who with us will work to serve you. Keep us close together, united through your Holy Spirit as we break bread and offer love, one with Jesus, our Master, for his sake we pray, amen. Friends, welcome.
Amen, indeed. That was certainly a prayer, and we will continue to pray this morning for the prayers of intercession or the prayers of the people. And before we do, I want to let you know about four letters of well-wishing that we will be sending to our friends. The first one is going to David Civarella. He's a dear friend of Elizabeth Caggiano's, and he's having surgery. We're also giving thanks for a new chaplain that has started his work at the Evergreens for Reverend Anthony Mamone. We welcome him. He is leading a Lenten small group with Dr. Jonathan Miller currently, and we're so grateful for his presence there and his leadership. We're also sending a letter to Sally and Steve Zulkind for their, the death of their son, Seth, and we are mourning with them and keeping them close to our hearts in prayer this week. And also we're sending one to the dear brothers at Holy Cross Monastery. They lost a dear friend and brother, Roy. And I've been up there, and it's just such an incredible community, and we are keeping them in our thoughts and our prayers as well. Also, uh, our friend Kathy Markle, uh, she wanted to let us know that it's, uh, she has dear friends in Beaver, Oklahoma. And to keep the town of Beaver in your prayers, they have disastrous fires, and the whole town has evacuated, and she has not heard from her dear friends. So let's keep that town and those people in our prayers as well. Friends, let's go to God this morning. O oh Lord, we so thank you that your spirit is here with us this morning. As, as our choir just sang that we desire to be a witness to you, O oh God, to your love and your grace and your new mercies, which reign over our lives every day. O oh God, like Psalm 61 says, we come before you right now, desiring you to simply hear our cry. Give heed to our prayers. From the ends of the earth, we will call to you, O oh God, because when our hearts are faint, we desire for you to lead us to the rock that is higher than us. O oh God, you are that rock that is higher than us on which we can find refuge. And so this morning we pray for those receiving a letter of well-wishing, whether we are celebrating the arrival of a new chaplain at the Evergreens for Reverend Anthony, or whether we are mourning with those who have suffered great loss, like the community of uh, the Holy Cross Monastery, or the Zalkin family, and the death of their son Seth. We also pray for David's recovery after his surgery, and for the town of Beaver, Oklahoma, Lord, be the rock, the higher ground on which they all can stand and find refuge and comfort in these times. Lord, we also know that we are human and we have limitations in many ways, but through your Holy Spirit, we have the power to overcome. And we know that there are relationships in our lives which give us many challenges for many reasons, whether we have suffered loss, separation, divorce, death, loneliness, isolation, or bitterness because of an exchange with someone. Psalm 25 teaches us to turn to you so that we can learn your gracious ways. And you acknowledge, as David did in Psalm 25, that we are lonely and we are afflicted. So, Lord, bring anyone who is going through a time of trouble in a relationship closer to you so that we can truly be followers of you, O oh Jesus, disciples that witness to your love, love of you and love of neighbor. God, also, will you be with us as we navigate locally and as a country what it means to deal with the coronavirus? It's so easy for that word to cause anxiety, to stir panic within, to cause us to rush to Costco and swipe everything off the shelves and put it in our cart. But Lord, we pray that instead of panic and thoughtless reactions, that we will thoughtfully, wisely, and compassionately respond. So deepen our empathy for others. Rid us of irrational fears and the forms they can take, like racism and prejudice. Help us to be united in your holy wisdom for the love and health of all. Protect medical workers, teachers, and all your children around the world as we join hands, perhaps metaphorically, for this uh, time so we can be preventative and loving no matter what. And God, we are also in this season of Lent. And in the early church, there's a time to prepare for our baptism, to learn what it means to die to self. 
God, we are in need of that, a baptism anew in your Holy Spirit. Just like Jesus told Nicodemus, you must be born anew if you are to follow me. So Lord, in this season of Lent, help us to renew our curiosity for you, Jesus. Help us to take off our masks. Compel us to speak our imperfect stories aloud. Release, release our grip on our knowledge and wanting to simply know about you rather than to know you personally. God, help us to embrace intimacy with you instead rather than worshiping our knowledge of you. Help us to worship you alone. Lord, we ask all these things in your holy name, knowing that you meet us right here in this room and everywhere we go, because you are a God who is not only with us, but for us and in us. And we ask all these things in your holy name, praying as Jesus taught us to boldly pray, saying together, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Friends, one other prayer concern. We learned that Jenny Legath's father passed away somewhat suddenly yesterday in Texas. Jenny is on her way to be with friends and family gathering there. And as I spoke to her yesterday, I told her that we will be praying for her. Our way of the week this week is number 11. Make others at home here. The way says, warmly welcome newcomers and visitors. Offer your name with a smile. Reach out and greet the person you don't know after worship, during coffee hour in youth group or Sunday school. Show genuine interest in others. In Romans 15, verse 7, we find this word, Welcome one another, therefore, as Christ has welcomed you for the glory of God. I love this way because you're only going to have to wait about 30 minutes to practice it. Make no mistake, though, my friends, this way matters a lot for the health of our church and our hope to welcome many more people of every age into our church family. Remember that warm is the new cool. This means that we are looking to turn up the heat around here by doing what this way says. Look for the new person. Offer your name with a smile. Reach out. Greet someone you don't know. Not just the, the guest or the visitor. Could be a 30-year member. Ask them to get coffee and bagels with you after worship. Who doesn't love Panera bagels? Here's a message that we want to convey every Sunday and every day someone walks into FPC Moorestown. You belong here. We're delighted. We're excited. We thank God that you're here. Think about what it would be like to walk into this church for worship or other ministries for the first time. How would you like to be welcomed? By the way, I think you do this well. So let's keep doing and improving what we're doing. We welcome others because Jesus Christ has welcomed us with joy and gladness and total welcome. FPC, make others at home here. So friends, let us now, with a spirit of joy, let us continue to worship God by bringing forth our morning tithes and offerings.
Friends, let us pray. As Thomas Aquinas said, give us, O Lord, thankful hearts which never forget your goodness to us. Give us, O Lord, grateful hearts which do not waste time complaining. O Lord, we pray that these gifts which we have given, they are only possible because of all of your generosity prior. This is simply our response to acknowledge your love and your mercy, your truth and your hope for your children everywhere. So may these gifts truly bless those who receive them. And may these gifts be a witness, not to just First Presbyterian Church, but first and foremost, your love and your presence in the lives of everyone, and your desire to be closer to them and to give everyone new life in the, in the specific way that they need it. We ask this in your son's name. Amen. Amen. Kyle Eidelman is the senior pastor of the Southeast Christian Church in Louisville, Kentucky. He is the author of the book many of us are reading in Lent. The book is entitled, Not a Fan, Becoming a Completely Committed Follower of Jesus. Kyle Eidelman in the past has served a mega church. He now serves another one. The church he serves welcomes some 20,000 people over the course of several worship services each weekend. With those kind of numbers, most would say that Kyle Eidelman is a very successful pastor. Kyle himself isn't so certain. He admitted as much when he once wrote these words. Too often in my preaching, he said, I have tried to talk people into following Jesus. I wanted to make following him as appealing, comfortable, and convenient as possible. And I want to say I am sorry. Why would a pastor who has preached the gospel to thousands of people apologize for trying to talk people into following Jesus? Kyle, Kyle Eidelman's concern about his preaching is that he may have created fans of Jesus, but not followers of him. He addressed this problem when he wrote, I think Jesus has a lot of fans these days. Fans who cheer for him when things are going well, but who walk away when it's a difficult season. Fans who sit safely in the stands cheering, but they know nothing of the sacrifice and pain on the field. Fans of Jesus who know all about him, but they really don't know him. The biggest threat to the church today, Kyle Eidemann says, is fans who call themselves Christian, but who aren't actually following Christ. They want to be close enough to Jesus to get all the benefits, but not so close that it requires anything from them. Here's the question that I hope haunts you in these weeks of Lent. I hope this question wakes you up at three in the morning. I hope this question nags you as you go for a walk or go food shopping this week. Are you a fan of Jesus? Or are you a follower? I've learned from Dr. Ed Gross, who preached here last Sunday, that the name Christian only appears in the New Testament three times. While the word disciple appears more than 250 times, not once, did Jesus ever use the word Christian? Disciple is clearly the name of choice for Jesus and for the New Testament. I'm now using the word Christian less and disciple more when I tell others about my relationship to Jesus Christ. I am or I very much desire to be a disciple. What about you? I hope that you too will claim this title and the radical commitment implied by it. If you are a fan of Jesus, now become his follower. 
my daily prayer after I commit my family to God is that FPC Morristown will soon become a congregation of disciples who make disciples. Are you ready? Our scripture lesson today is found in the gospel according to Luke chapter 5 verses 27 through 32. It's going to be found on page 63 in your pew Bibles. I invite you to take a Bible and follow along with me as I read. In this portion of Luke's gospel, we find the account of a tax collector named Levi who became a disciple by the call or the invitation of Jesus. Levi was an unlikely candidate to be a disciple. That's immediate good news for you and for me. For you don't have to be highly trained in the Bible or theology to be a disciple. You don't even have to be a particularly good person. You just have to be ready for Jesus' call to become his disciple. So listen now to the word of God as it's found in Luke chapter 5, beginning with verse 27. After this, Jesus went out and saw a tax collector named Levi sitting at the tax booth. And he said to him, follow me. And he got up, left everything, and followed him. Then Levi gave a great banquet for him in his house, and there was a large crowd of tax collectors and others sitting at table with them. The Pharisees and their scribes were complaining to his disciples, saying, Why do you eat and drink with tax collectors and sinners, scum like these? Jesus answered them, Those who are well have no need of a physician, but those who are sick. I have come not to call the righteous, but sinners to repentance. Would you pray with me for the proclamation of the gospel of Jesus Christ our Lord today? Let us pray. Lord Jesus, you once called Levi to follow you. He was in the middle of an ordinary day going about his business when you saw him and called him. Lord Jesus, would you call every one of my friends today and would you call me too? For Lord, we're ready to follow by your grace. May the words of my mouth and the meditations of our hearts May they be acceptable in your sight, for you are our strength and our redeemer. Amen. 2,000 years ago, disciples were quite common in Israel. By some estimates, there were over 800 discipleship groups with disciples and followers, including John the Baptist, who had his own disciples. A disciple was simply someone who made a commitment to a teacher or a rabbi, another name for a teacher. You tell me, I believe in Jesus, I gave my heart to him, and I trust that I will go to heaven when I die. Doesn't that make me a disciple of Jesus? 2,000 years ago, disciples did five things. As you try to understand what it means to become a follower or disciple of Jesus, you may find this list to be helpful. First, a disciple memorized their teacher's words. Second, a disciple learned the way their teacher thought and lived. As Ed Gross wrote, every detail about the teacher was important to the disciple. Third, The highest goal of a disciple was to imitate their master in everything. Disciples sought to speak and to act exactly as their teacher. Fourth, disciples made other disciples. Fifth, disciples submitted totally to the will of their rabbi or their teacher. Are you a fan or are you a follower of Jesus? 
use these five points as a checklist. Have you memorized the teachings of Jesus? Why, you ask, I've got five Bibles in my home. Here's why. What fills your mind is what tends to consume you and therefore direct you. Is your mind full of politics these days? The coronavirus these days is because you're filling your mind with either. Memorize the scriptures, the teachings of Jesus in particular, and they will begin to impact your life and shape it. Number two, have you learned the ways of Jesus thinking and his way of life? Do you speak as he spoke and go to the kinds of people he sought out? Are you making disciples? Are you ready to fully obey Jesus and his commands with a spirit of total submission to him? Close to 200 of us are reading the book, Not a Fan, and the early word that I've heard from a few people is that this is a good book, but it's a hard read. These challenging ideas about moving from fandom to following Jesus are pushing a lot of you well out of your comfort zone. I hope so. And if you're getting pushed, thank God. Can I offer you some encouragement when you consider the first followers of Jesus, they were anything but impressive spiritual giants. His disciples stumbled and fumbled in their early attempts at discipleship. Here's one thing that Jesus did and still does that no other rabbi or teacher in his day did. Jesus called people to follow him. In the first century, students always asked teachers if they could become their disciples. Jesus always makes the first move with you. He still does. Today, he calls you to be his disciple. I'll tell you, there is life-altering power in that simple invitation. It's the power that enables us to follow him. What's contained or found in Jesus' call to discipleship to you? Well, for starters, in the words of N.T. Wright, forgiveness now walks down the street. It's a great line. What he's saying is that perfect and full forgiveness from every wrong there is to any who want it and are ready to turn towards forgiveness, your, that forgiveness is yours in full. There's also unequal power in the voice of Jesus when he calls you. If you page through the first four chapters of the book of Luke, you'll see what Jesus' voice can do. For instance, the voice of Jesus commanded demons to come out of demon-infested lives, and they did. Jesus' voice brought healing to those who were hopeless. At a word, they were healed. That same powerful voice now speaks a word of love and acceptance to you that brings an entirely new way of life to you. Levi, who's also known as Matthew, was a tax collector. In the Roman Empire, most people were subjected to many taxes. Like us, they paid road taxes and bridge taxes, taxes on clothing, taxes on property. As Fred Craddock wrote, the task to collect those many taxes was usually given to wealthy and powerful people. Levi was probably on Herod's payroll. It was widely known that tax collectors often collected more money than was required, therefore they were universally considered corrupt. And thus, they were despised by nearly everyone. We see this in the case of Levi because the only people who attend the big party he threw for Jesus were other tax collectors and outcasts like him. Let's go to Levi's house where he threw a huge party for Jesus. 
In verse 19 of Luke chapter 5, we read, Shortly after this, Levi invited his many friends and associates, including many tax collectors, to his home for a large feast in Jesus' honor. Everyone sat together with Jesus. You see, it was an honor for Levi to have been called by Jesus to become one of his disciples. And so it was important for Levi to repay the honor, and he did so with a big meal. Right away, when asked if he'll come to the feast, Jesus answered, I never miss a party. I'll be there. Jesus sat down with the worst of the worst and shared a meal with them. He passed the bread. He listened to their stories. He told jokes. I want to tell you, this is huge. You see, for this reason, the Pharisees and the scribes, who are witnesses of this meal, look with disgust at this dinner party. Turning to Peter, James, and John, a few of Jesus' early disciples, they murmur beneath their breath, Why do you eat and drink with such scum? You see, the scribes and the Pharisees, those moral and church-going people, would never associate with crooks and wicked people like those in Levi's house. As As author Philip Yancey wrote, the Pharisees thought of their dining room table as a kind of little temple, which explains why they refused to dine with sinners like Levi and his friends. They kept their distance from sinners because sinners would make them unclean and because they thought that God keeps distance from evil and messed up people until they get their lives together. Levi, well, perhaps Jesus understood his table as a little temple as well, which explains why he leapt at the chance to eat with a motley assortment of dining companions. The great banquet, God's party, is now open to everyone. And God is crazy in love with sinners of every kind. Levi's new master or teacher said to his critics, healthy people don't need a doctor, but sick people do. I haven't come for the pure and upstanding. No, I've come to call notorious sinners to rethink their lives and turn to God. In this way, the call to discipleship is always self-selecting. His call to follow, which is also a call to forgiveness and healing for the sick and the sinful, it's really only for the sick and the sinful. The healthy and the righteous simply have no need for a healer, thus no need for a savior or for a teacher. Now let's talk about the first step of discipleship. It's repentance. And it means to turn from something to something, sometimes with tears and sadness and regret, sometimes just from a desire that I want life to be different. Dietrich Bonhoeffer helpfully instructs us about repentance with these words. Listen. The call to discipleship involves a turnabout and therefore a complete break and a new beginning. It always involves a decision of the new day. The seizing of an opportunity that was not present yesterday but is now given in and with the call of Jesus. Inevitably, people who are called by Jesus renounce and turn away from themselves as they were yesterday. This is what it means to deny oneself. This is what it means to repent. In late October, I visited visited the Grunig Museum in Bruges, Belgium. came across a painting by Jacob Van Oost, He lived from the year 1603 to 1671. 
And I stood before a painting of his called The Calling of Matthew. Remember that Matthew is the same person as the Levi in our story. Oost sent his painting in his day. In the painting, Matthew or Levi wore the clothes of a businessman from the 17th century. Levi sits behind his work desk with many people facing him. Jesus is in the far right corner of the painting as he walks away while he looks over his shoulder at Levi. Levi's back is to the artist, but he is turned in his chair. His eyes are open and bright and riveted to Jesus. One of Levi's hands holds his chair while the other his table it looks like he's made his decision. He's ready to forsake his old life. And he's ready for the new life that Jesus has waiting for him. He's ready to rise and he's ready to follow. He's ready to be a disciple. Amen. seated as we hear music to send us into the world as disciples is offered by Karen Malloy, one of our new members. Two questions I want you to think about and pray about as Karen plays. Are you sick or are you healthy? Are you a fan or are you a follower?
Friends, would you stand? And if you would like, join hands. If you'd rather, put your arms out or you can say no to. Any of that's fine. We're going to give room for each other for what we need to do. But I'd like you to pray for each other because here's the thing you've got to understand. There's, it's impossible to follow Jesus alone. There's no sense of discipleship by doing it by yourself. Won't happen, can't happen. So you can thank God, if nothing else, for the people who surround you as we seek to follow him as his disciples. Would you pray a prayer, a blessing for the hands you hold? And now may the Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord be gracious to you. May the Lord's face shine with joy because of you. And may the Lord's peace, which surpasses all understanding, keep your hearts and your minds at rest in Christ Jesus, both now and forevermore. Amen.